Hello and welcome to another episode of It Came From The Page. And today we are going to be talking about the books that got me into reading. And those are... The Crestwood House Monster Books. Now these are just three of them. Um, there were many, many more uh, in this series. Um, these are all from libraries because if you look online, these go for like incredibly high amounts of money online. Uh, so just so you know, I don't actually own these. These are what my actual local library still has in stock, which is actually really cool because these books right here are books that I've only ever known as library books. I've never owned these books. Back in the day, my local library always had this event, which was this summer reading event, where you would go in, you would check out books, and whatever books you checked out, you could check it off and be like, oh, I read like this many books a week and like blah, 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 blah. And there was like a certain set amount of number that you were supposed to read in the summer. So it's like, oh, hey, kids, come in, mark down what you're reading in the summer. And every time you read something in the thing, you can put, uh, I think it was like you could like put a piece of paper in for a draw. Whatever the draw is, I never won the draw. So I don't actually know what you could have won from this event, but I did participate year after year. And the thing is, year after year, the only books I ever took out from the library were these babies. Because there was exactly the right amount of Crestwood House monster books that equaled the, like, the max number you could get of entries and the things that you needed to mark upon these scavenger hunts. Uh, so... You might be asking yourself, what the hell is a Crestwood House monster book? Now, these are books that were all written by a moniker of Ian Thorne, but were, that was actually a pseudonym for the author Julian May. Julian May was a fairly big science fiction author of the era. Um, these are all books that came out in the 70s and 80s. There were a few lines of the Crestwood House monster books. And uh, these ones, a lot of these are actually reprints. So um, you can see on the backs where it says all of the different, like, amounts of books that the numbers kind of fluctuate. Because, see, once we got this King Kong reprint, you can see there's a huge sloth of different titles under that. And same with this. So these are, like, all about these little mini books written by Julian May uh that are that were old when i was born right i was born in 1992 i was probably reading these in about 90 probably like 97 uh and by that point they were like nearly 20 years old so uh some of them actually were 20 years old funnily enough and for whatever reason they have sat in my library and these are kind of the reason why my opinions on things are very very outdated i've never really known what was cool in whatever era we're in and that's because of things like this i'm a person who my wallet right now is bop, 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 a universal monsters wallet and my keychain on that wallet is a godzilla keychain my masks that i wore all throughout 2020 and beyond i'm still wearing masks i know oh god the wokies are at it again but i'm still wearing masks bitch come for me in the streets don't actually please leave me alone people always go like me you wearing your mask anyways that's entirely not the point of this video uh, but uh all of my masks are various monsters i have like a mothra mask i have like a shin godzilla mask and i have a gamera mask um I legitimately had a stroke watching a giant monster movie. So when I had my stroke in September 11th of 2020, I, I know, what a date. What a date to have it. Um, uh, I had the stroke while I was in the middle of watching a Gamera movie, which was uh, Gamera vs. Veras or Destroy All Planets. There was a few different titles for them. Uh, the Arrow video set had just come out, and I was watching it with commentary. And in the middle of watching it with commentary, I had my stroke. Um, first thing I did when I got home from the stroke is I just put on the movie and finished it because I wanted to know 
what the rest of the commentary was. So, you know, the, the, these long lines of um, ways that I have just continuously been uncool and have just been the biggest monster nerd in all of my life all dates back to these books. Now, first things first, I will say that, like, if you are an adult and you're in the modern era using this for research materials, it's probably not the best thing to do. Um, a lot of the information in this is is both dated and incorrect. That's not hugely important, uh, although like it is notable. So for both um, the King Kong, King Kong and Godzilla, uh, reading these back in the day, uh, they propagated the uh, myth that in King Kong versus Godzilla, the American version and the Japanese version, there were two different endings: one where Godzilla won, one where King Kong won. Now, that is not true. That is a myth. Uh, that's a myth that is propagated to this day. Uh, I've seen both versions. The endings are the same. It's not a big, it's not a big change. There's nothing, nothing going on there. Um, and the, this book is the first time I encountered that uh, popular myth. It, it's not that important, right? This video is not going to, I'm not here to, to nitpick and be like, they got this wrong. Because what I feel like these books actually do succeed at doing is giving you the feel of these monster movies in about 50 pages or so. So, you know, the Godzilla one especially, like there are a lot of uh, names of monsters and uh, creatures that appear in Godzilla films that are just incorrect. Like there's misspellings, there's, uh, you know, creature names that are that are given to creatures that it's, it's not their names. But what it does is has these amazing photos and there is this level of just uh love for these movies so it's it really does kind of point one of the things that i think is kind of annoying in culture today especially when you're talking about um old books or old movies or things like that is uh oh you're incorrect you are not a real fan are you a real fan name fun songs from this band blah, 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 blah. and that is like if you are a person trying to teach about a thing in a class okay if you're calling yourself a research paper okay that that does matter having the facts correct or knowing a lot about whatever material you're teaching if you're just a fan of something bitch you don't need to be accurate at all you just need to love something and love the tone of something and a book like this, so this is the one I, I checked out the most, not surprising anyone. So this is the Godzilla book. And I just want to read to you the, the last page of this. Because I think it, it encapsulates everything that is good about this series of books. And why this series got me down into this love of classic monster fiction. Some people have said that the Godzilla movies are like a comic book. And so they are. But what's wrong with that? Many other critics have enjoyed the movies. Their special effects are wonderful, and the plots are almost always good fun for both adults and children. It doesn't matter that all Godzilla's actions aren't realistic. Millions of people around the world wouldn't miss a mon monstrous moment of them. And it's got this amazing photo, and then it has the uh, special effects director... Uh, E.G. Tsuburaya in here with the Godzilla suit and it just captures everything that is important and fun and what really matters about these movies and what's really impactful about these movies is that they are fun they are exuberant they are colorful there are deeper messages in a lot of them and what is impressive about uh, a book like this particularly um Julian May does not shy away from the uh, the importance of the nuclear messaging in in Godzilla, right? So she openly regards that this is about the nuclear bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, which is which is fantastic. Um, and also, what is really kind of cool is in the um, King Kong section, um, she gets briefly into the history uh, of King Kong and how things were made. Obviously, it's a super small book, so it's not like super in depth, but she does credit some really important people that could easily be forgotten in a book like this. Uh, mainly Marcel Delgado, who is the 
uh, Mexican American man who sculpted the look of King Kong. So all of those original models in King Kong were were sculpted and and made to be on film by Marcel Delgado. So this the reason why King Kong looks the way he does is all because of Marcel Delgado. And Marcel Delgado doesn't get enough credit. And it's super cool that a book like this does see fit to, to mention him. Um, same with the, the Godzilla. They, they do kind of have a little snippet to talk about the uh, effects of these films and how they were created and how they were came into the world. And they do it in such a, a very cool way. Now, again, I'm, I, you know... These aren't all like super accurate, but they have this like awesome like thing to talk about the behind the scenes special effects. And what these books really do is they capture as a child reading these books, because what they are is there's like a little description of whatever the first movie is. And then little tiny bits and pieces, maybe a sentence or two about other movies that are sequels of it or things that are kind of inspired by it. The King Kong one especially has a lot of other eight movies that Julia May touches upon. Um, and she writes in such a way that really captures the imagination. Because for ages, um, these King Kong movies, I had never seen a King Kong movie aside from King Kong versus Godzilla for a very long time. So um, a lot of my experience with early King Kong stuff was because I read a book like this and learned about the other movies that were inspired and were inspired by that original King Kong. And she writes about it in such a way that it captures the feelings of these movies without doing a plot by plot by plot exhaustive run through. Uh, another good example is the Frankenstein book uh, is awesome because again i had not seen any of these frankenstein movies for a very very long time uh, i would say probably around college is when i first actually sat down and watched some of these classic universal monster movies but they were always in my mind because i read all of these books because there was one for dracula there was one for the mummy there was one for the wolfman uh there's one for creature from the black lagoon right like there are so many monster specific versions of these books that would relay what is that first movie about what are the sequels about how many sequels were there who else made frankenstein movies right and like these are you know these are not long books they are also made for children but they really capture the spirit of these movies and what as a kid just drew me back and continued to make me uh read and research and look up more and more monster movies so it, it's something really impressive about a, a book like this is that it captures the spirit it doesn't have to be fully accurate it doesn't have to be a plot by plot beatdown. it captures the spirit of what it's talking about and i kind of think that's probably true for a lot of things on like booktube if you are doing a booktube review uh Unless you're trying to make like a very specific educational, uh, in-depth exploration uh, of a of a piece or a material, um, the really the important part about doing a book review is capturing the feel of something and why did this or why did this book or this piece of art speak to you and really kind of make you want to know more about it or continue reading it or make you excited or sad or whatever emotions it kind of like hits you with is because you kind of can capture the feel of it right i if i'm reviewing a book i shouldn't be doing a plot by plot by plot synopsis i just need to tell you the feel of a piece of art and why i liked it and you'll either agree or disagree but you will know my honest opinions based on finding out how I feel about something. And uh, the, yeah, that's why uh, books like this are amazing. Uh, these are library books, and I think, unfortunately, I'm sure these books will be sold off eventually. All of these are not from, like, the bigger branches of my public library. They are from, because uh, I live in Saskatchewan, a province in Canada, they are still things that are sitting at old, old libraries who have had an a stock for a, a for again a lot of those are over 
at this point, we're looking at near... Some of them are, are nearing 40 years old, 40, 50 years old. Like, they are old books, and they are still in great condition. They still look great. You can tell people have read them. You can tell people have loved them. You know, you, you see the wear and tear these things have over the years. And I feel like they should always be a library book. These are kind of things that we should encourage to just have at every library. Uh, I'm sure these will go away eventually when they have like a rehaul and they have to say goodbye to certain books. And that's what happened to my local library. Uh, I There was a moment where I went back and they just weren't there anymore. And you know, now if you look online, they're sold for like hundreds of dollars because people want to own their childhoods. To which I say, bleh, ownership is bleh. You don't want to own childhood. You want to make sure other people have also have cool childhoods where they can also discover cool artwork you don't need to own anything. You just need to continue to foster libraries. Libraries are important. Libraries should be a human right. Uh, and I think books like that uh, incorporate why libraries are so awesome. I love libraries. Uh, they continue to bring you great, great things. So I'm glad that those still exist at the library. Uh, before we go too far, I also want to talk about some things that are also inspired by the Crestwood House Monster Books. Now, uh, unfortunately, just because of how these are published, uh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it costs a lot to do hardbacks these days, right? So this is a, a book written by John LeMay. John LeMay is a, a huge super fan uh, of the giant monster landscape. Um, and he has written a lot of really compelling behind the scenes information behind the scenes books uh he he focuses a lot on unmade films unearthing old scripts so he's done stuff for like godzilla he's done the unmade films of king kong and he does really really good research and they're really uh great research materials if that's something that you're interested in in in, in covering and and adopting uh, as you go on uh, about your giant monster landscape but he also wrote this which is a love letter to the crestwood house monster books and you know you can you you can kind of see it you can kind of see it the, the the layout of these books how they're how they read how they look it really does just really captures that spirit of the crestwood monster book feel so you know, these are books that have a legacy. I am I love that that I learned that recently that they were all under the pseudonym of, of Julian May. I've never read a Julian May science fiction book, but since she uh, really helped get me on this weird, weird road that you now find myself on, I think I'm going to add one to my TBR. Uh, thank you guys. I hope you guys are having a good day. Uh, and catch you later. If you have any, if you have any memories of the Crestwood House monster books, please let me know. Uh, thanks and have a good day. Goodbye.